Hey everyone, this is David Brown with the Migration Update for March 18th, 2022 from the Braddock Bay Hawkwatch. The day started out mostly cloudy with light winds and overall warm temperatures. We had one flock of 19 tundra swans drop onto the bay, and remember that tundra swans migrate in groups and have all black bills. We had a handful of killdeer throughout the morning, and remember, killdeer have pointed wings, so they can sometimes be mistaken for a falcon at a distance, but notice the unique plumage with these double stripes on the upper breast. There were a handful of song sparrows around the park and singing this morning, and Song sparrows are one of our stripey sparrows. You see the striping on the upper breast and sides, and also this dot in the center. Sparrows can be difficult to identify, and I've heard this funny story where a beginner birder goes up to a more experienced birder, and they say, how did you know that that was a song sparrow, for example? And the experienced birder says, well, because it looked like one. And the beginner goes away feeling like the experienced birder was hiding something or being elitist and not wanting to share, but the experienced birder was telling the truth. They didn't use those individual field marks. They just have seen so many song sparrows and other types of sparrows that when you see one, you immediately recognize them. I think it's similar to when you run into a family member. You don't have to list the field marks. Okay, she's got dark hair. She's got glasses, right? You just know what your family members look like. And with birds, it gets to be the same way. When you've seen enough of them, you just know what they are. Everything fits that species from the way it moves, the way it looks, the way it sounds. So keep that in mind as you're trying to improve your bird identification. It's not all about picking out individual field marks. A lot of it's more about the general impression. By mid-morning, the skies had cleared and it really turned into a beautiful day, and the wind shifted around to be from the north, but we still ended up with a really great hawk flight. Here we have an excipiter. We can see that it has quite a long tail, and this is actually a cooper's hawk, and we know that because it's got a big head that sticks out much farther than the wings, and also the streaking on the upper breast. It has this, um, if it was perched vertically, it would look like brown teardrop streaking, and that's typical of juvenile Cooper's hawks. Here we have an adult red-shouldered hawk, and it's got the orange underside, the black tail that looks like a chalkboard with chalk lines on it, pale crescents near the wingtips. Here it's missing part of a feather, pale crescent on the other side. So just a very classic look at an adult red-shouldered hawk. And actually, over the course of a couple hours, we had 100 red-shouldered hawks. It was a huge morning flight of turkey vultures and red-shouldered hawks and was pretty spectacular. Here we have another juvenile Cooper's hawk. So we're looking at the same field marks. Big head, holds its wings out straight, and this teardrop streaking on the upper breast. And the tail shape doesn't help us too much. I guess we can see that the outer tail feathers are a little shorter, but really just this part of the bird just screams Cooper's hawk. Here's another adult red-shouldered hawk. This one's in a glide, but we see the same field marks as we saw on the other ones, even if they're a little less obvious, like the pale crescents near the wingtip and the striping on the tail. Here we have an adult red-tailed hawk. We see the dark patagial bars, the belly band, and we know it's an adult because it has a dark trailing edge to the wing and a red tail. We had a group of six sandhill cranes that we spotted way off in the distance, and then we got distracted sorting through the hawks that were overhead, and the cranes snuck up on us, so I got a photo just after they had passed by. Here we have a sharp-shinned hawk, and let's look at a couple things. First of all, the head looks very tiny, although from this angle, it's a little hard to judge. But we see that it's pushing its wrists forward, and the head doesn't really stick out past the wings at all. We also see this very, very, very squared off tail. This is probably a male sharp-shinned hawk, which are smaller than the females and tend to have these really squared off tail tips. So this is kind of an extreme example of a sharp-shinned hawk that's easier to identify. The larger females can look similar to male Cooper's hawks, so we have to be careful. But this is classic sharp-shinned hawk with that small head, squared off tail, The wings always, to me, look a little more rounded than the Cooper's hawks, which tend to hold them out straight. Just a more compact bird overall. Maybe the wings don't look as long, the tail doesn't look as long. Doesn't look as lanky as a Cooper's hawk. 
This is more of a flying T rather than a flying cross. Here we have another adult red-shouldered hawk, and this photo didn't come out completely sharp, but I wanted to include it because it's an example of one of these more heavily marked red-shouldered hawks. And someone commented on my Facebook post yesterday and said it's actually the females that tend to be more heavily marked and have what looks similar to the belly band that red-tailed hawks have. Here we have a light morph rough-legged hawk, very distinctive. Remember, we have these squares that are dark, and you have the super dark belly, like someone took a Sharpie and just colored it in. Just very black and white contrasting overall, very distinctive. And the rough leg was actually fighting with a red-tailed hawk, and I was actually quite surprised to see how much larger the rough leg was than the red tail. And one more thing about rough legs is they tend to hold their wings up in a little bit of a V or a little bit of a dihedral. So that's a field mark that you can sometimes pick up on from a distance. Here's yet another adult red-shouldered hawk. And almost all of the red shoulders we're seeing this time of year are the adults, which tend to migrate first because they're trying to get up to their nesting grounds as quickly as possible because they're going to be competing for territories. The juveniles can afford to take their time a little bit more. And we see that this one isn't that heavily marked underneath like that other one we looked at. So there is a range of variation. Here we have a juvenile sharp-shinned hawk. Let's look at a couple field marks. First of all, if we look at the head, super tiny. And the face is really kind of cute looking. Just the way the, the placement of the eye and the small beak. It has more of a cute look compared to the really fierce look of a Cooper's hawk. If we look at the tail... It's hard to judge if all of the tail feathers are the same length or not when the tail is spread this much. Ideally, we want the tail to only be spread a little bit. So that's a little hard to judge on this bird. And if we look at the underside streaking, um, we see that the marking on the juvenile sharp shinned hawk can be quite different from that of the juvenile Cooper's hawk. Remember, on Cooper's hawks, we have a brown teardrop streaking that's mostly on the upper breast. On these juvenile sharpies, a lot of them have this kind of thicker, blobbier markings on the underside that almost look similar to the orange barring of the adults. So there are some sharp shinned hawks that show that teardrop streaking like the Cooper's hawks have, but this is the more typical plumage that you'll see on the underside of sharp shinned hawks. Here's another adult red tailed hawk. So patagial bars, belly band dark trailing edge to the wing, and red tail. Here we have another swan, but this one's got some black on the face and the bill looks pinkish or orange. So this is a mute swan. Here we have an adult sharp shinned hawk. So if we look at those same field marks as we looked at on the juvenile, again, really small head. It barely sticks out past the wings. You can imagine if this bird was more distant, you wouldn't even really see the head sticking out at all. It would look like a T rather than a cross. And if we look at the tail tip, super, super, super squared off. You can see that these outer tail feathers are just as long as the central tail feathers. We know this is an adult because on the underside it has orange horizontal barring. And it also looks like this bird has a full crop, which means it has eaten recently. The northern shrike is still around and gave us some nice looks when it perched nearby. Here we have another adult red-tailed hawk, this one in a glide, and I hope you all know the field marks by now. Dark patagial bars, belly band, and on the adults, dark trailing edge to the wing, and red tail. Eventually the wind shifted to a northeast lake breeze, so I moved to Frisbee Hill Park at 2 o'clock, and I actually took this photo when I was on my way out when it had really clouded over. It was sunny when I first got there. But this is the area that we stand, right up near this windbreak. There's a cell phone tower that ospreys actually nest on. And we actually look out towards the right in this photo is the direction that the hawks come from. Between 2 and 4 p.m. there was a pretty steady stream of turkey vultures. And this is kind of a classic pose of a turkey vulture gliding towards you. Here is another adult red-tailed hawk. So dark patagial bars, belly band dark trailing edge to the wing, and red tail. And you can notice that some of the tips of the feathers are a bit damaged. So here we have the side view of an eagle as it glides by. And actually, this is a bald eagle. So let's talk about how we know that. 
First of all, it's got a large head. In fact, the head looks like it sticks out just about as much as the tail does. Bald eagles have large heads. Golden eagles, their heads look much smaller. They look like they stick out less than the tail. Another thing to look at is where there is white. We see a lot of white in this wing pit area. And whenever we see that, we know that it is an immature bald eagle rather than a golden eagle. Immature bald eagles tend to be messier with where the white is on the underside. If there's any white at all on a golden eagle, it is in neat patches in the center of the wings and a neat patch at the base of the tail. So whenever you have uh, an eagle with white in this wing pit area and just blobby throughout the wings, that's a bald eagle. And also just from the shape, large headed means bald eagle. And if we take a look at our eBird checklist from today, we had 56 species in Braddock Bay Park. And at Frisbee Hill, 25 species. If we look at hawk count to see our migrant raptor totals, today we had 295 turkey vultures, two bald eagles, nine northern harriers, six sharp-shinned hawks, seven cooper's hawks, exactly 100 red-shouldered hawks, and actually I never check the totals throughout the day, so when you end up with even numbers like this, it's just a coincidence. Um, if I knew it was going to be 100, I probably would have snuck an extra one on just to avoid the round number. 25 red-tailed hawks, two rough-legged hawks, two American kestrels, for a total of 448. So today actually ended up being the biggest day of the season, which was a little surprising to me because of the northerly winds. I would have expected yesterday to be better than today, but uh, we had a massive hawk liftoff in the morning which also surprised me because I didn't think there would be many birds along the lake shore because of yesterday's lake breeze. I thought they would be farther inland. The only new species for the season was hairy woodpecker, which I got as I was leaving Frisbee Hill Park. And the forecast for tomorrow, rain and thunderstorms high in the low 60s, winds south-southwest at 10 to 20 miles per hour. So these are good winds, but it will depend a lot on how much rain we actually end up getting. But in the periods of the day when it's not raining and the wind is strong enough, I wouldn't be surprised if we get some turkey vultures migrating and maybe some red-shouldered hawks and red-tailed hawks. Um, we're not really seeing a lot of falcons and occipiters yet, but we might get small numbers of them moving. They're more likely to tolerate these kind of uh, rainy conditions. They're less dependent on thermals and the sun. They don't mind flapping a little bit, so they'll migrate on these rainy days. For Sunday, maybe some lingering rain showers and then overcast and windy. Strong west winds, so I think we'll see some migration, but not a huge day. And Monday, mix of sun and clouds early, then cloudy, high in the upper 40s, light westerly winds. So that's looking like a fairly good day. I think we should get a decent number of migrants that day. All right, that's it for today. If you like these videos, please hit the like button and subscribe and hit the notifications bell so you don't miss any of these daily updates from the Braddock Bay Hawkwatch. This is David Brown. Thanks for watching.